Okay. Well, so welcome to the reading. Among the previous Holloway poets are such notable figures as Louise Glick, Michael Palmer, Paul Mundoon, Yusuf Kumanyaka, Ann Carson, Mark McMorris, Judith Goldman, Ed Roberson, and last year, Anna Moskovakis. Next year's Holloway poet will be Giovanni Singleton. And let me remind you briefly as well of the coming Holloway series events, a reading by George Stanley next week, Thursday the 29th, and a reading in Mixed Blood Talk by Tanya Foster on October 19th, and a reading by Gary Snyder on the 27th of October. In a few moments, John Shopta will introduce Mary Shebus, the current Holloway lecturer in poetry and poetics. This lectureship came into ex existence uh, in 1981 through a bequest given to the English department as part of the estate of Roberta C. Holloway, uh, who received her BA degree in English with honors from UC Berkeley in 1932 and her uh, PhD here in uh, 19, 1945. Now let me talk briefly about Roberta Holloway's bequest as a poet and in due course, one with a PhD in English, it was her lifelong ambition to teach, even, uh, even if only briefly, at her alma mater, UC Berkeley. This opportunity never came to Roberta Holloway. She spent her teaching career at San Jose State. But as she reached the end of her life, she decided generously to make such an opportunity possible for other poets. She left what at the time was a fair amount of money to UC Berkeley's English department as a bequest to be as bequest to be devoted to bringing a poet for a semester to Berkeley to teach and enjoy the creative and intellectual culture of the Department of English. <coughs> as required by the terms of the bequest, the committee supervising the lectureship was chaired by Josephine Miles for as long as she was an active faculty member. Josephine Miles died in uh, 1985, and she was the first woman to be tenured in Berkeley's English department. She was a nationally recognized and much honored poet and whose work is now, that now has canonical status in American poetry of the uh, 20th century. And here's, I'm gonna make an offering. Here's an offering uh, to the traditions of this event. A poem by Josephine Miles. Um, a poem uh, that I was reminded of by my, my friend Lisa Steinman. Uh, it's a song to paper boys and to the art of newspaper delivery. Mm -hmm. And it's called Herald, that's H-E-R-A-L-D, Herald. Delivers papers to the doors of sleep, tosses up news upon the shores of sleep. In the day's damp, in the street's swamp, wades deep and is himself the boy drowned, drowned with sleep. Crosses to the corner with the lamp already dark, even asleep the lamp treads in the wet grass, wears, leaps as in swamp, the gutters dark with darkening of the lamp. Here's only the thud and thud against the doors of the news falling asleep against the doors, the slip and drip of mist on the two shores, sees without light or sight the coasts of doors, sees at a door a light Herald, sir, wakes to the whistle and light. Herald, sir, to the latch lifted and the face's blur wakes. Wakes coin, day, greeting. Herald, sir. John Chopta. I really wanted to do my Dalek impersonation, but the mic is off, so there's no exterminate. <laughs> Does anyone know who the Daleks even are? Yeah. Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm John Shoptaw. I'm uh, happy indeed to be introducing Mary Shebus. Uh, uh, we heard her visiting Holloway Lecture in Poetry and Poetics, so much so that I'd like to say a few words about happiness in Shebus poetry. Happiness from Hap, uh, chance or fortune familiar to you from perhaps, and my favorite mayhap, happenstance and happen chance. Of course, happen. Uh, let's not forget about mishap. 
and the hapless. It just so happens, for instance, that today is the autumnal equinox in the northern hemisphere, uh, vernal in the southern, when the sun shoots its rays smack dab in the middle of the equator of our warming blue and green globe. Uh, poetically, a happy uh, moment is the timely intersection of the timeless with time, or less eleotically, the conjunction of the poetry notebook with the independent press, or more immediately, uh, the poet herself with the poetic germ or fruitful idea when the poet becomes big with poem. And if it's a really good idea, it feels as though it comes to you rather than you happening upon it. And yes, when this happens, whether the material is happy or unhappy, poets experience happiness even in the form of relief. Constantly, I write this happily, writes Virginia. Happiness then takes us back to the conception of the poem. In the instance of Shiva's latest book, it's likened to the Annunciation Capital A, the announcement or herald uh, from the angel, Gabriel, angel meaning messenger, that Mary is big with God's child. But Shiva's book is called Incarnadine, not Incarnation, which reminds me first of Macbeth's indelibly bloodstained hands, and next of the multitudinous canvases incarnadined and ultramarined by Renaissance painters. To give you a sense of what Shebus makes, of what comes to her, I want to look at a couple of titles from Incarnadine. Among a number of modernizations, we find I Send News and Update on Mary. Uh, my favorite of these is Knocking or Nothing. Think of Rummy and of a knocked up tummy. Uh, happy Ideas itself, uh, you'll remember, uh, begins with a quote by uh, Marcel Duchamp. I had the happy idea to fasten a bicycle wheel to a kitchen stool and watch it turn. And Shebus had the happy idea of making a poem by giving Duchamp's found language a few happy turns of phrase, the first being, I had the happy idea to suspend some blue globes in the air and watch them pop. Blue balloons here become merry, rendered in the style of pop art. Mary Shebus has an irreverently wicked sense of humor, which you wouldn't expect from and from Annunciation poems, such as Annunciation in Nabokov and Star. That's Vladimir and Kenneth Starr of the Star Report on Bill Clinton. And yes, there's, <laughs> there's poetic justice in the world. Kenneth Starr resigns in disgrace from Baylor over a cover-up of a sexual assault. That's poetic justice. Occasionally that visits us. Uh, Sheepus, though, uses language from Guess Which Novel and the Star Report to render Mary as a composite of Lolita and Monica. When she stood up together, the almost erasable sense into the damp folds of her blue dress, don't you know the DNA is intact? Now, the Duchampian procedure of an unusual joining of familiar elements existed long before Duchamp, as is evident in Shebus Stevensian title, Insertion of Meadow with Flowers, which begins in 1372, beneath the angel's feet, Veneziano added a meadow. Here, Shebus uses a happy idea from a catechism commentary. God could have chosen other means than flesh to reincarnate Mary as meadow flowers, reminiscent of the lilies of the field, Flowers that do not spin, not even the threads of their shadows. Shadows, no doubt, blue. I was struck, 
particularly by the horrifying conjunction in the environmental poem, Annunciation as Right Whale and Kelp Gulls, Think Mary and the Angel. Sheba's germ here is an annunciatory bulletin from BBC News. The gulls have learned to feed upon the whales. In the biblical language of the poem, for they do sit and eat, for they do sit and eat. I hear a dark turn taken on George Herbert's love. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Happiness comes then, not only to the poet, but to the poetry reader who has the good fortune of happening upon Sheba's poems, as I did just a couple years back. And in my case, the additional happiness of announcing to our Bay Area audience uh, the reading of our Holloway poet, Mary Sheba. Thank you, John. Welcome. Uh, thank you uh, for coming tonight. Thank you to Berkeley for having me. Uh, thank you uh, to my students. I want to begin with a poem. Can you hear me? I want to begin with a poem by the Argentine poet Juan Hellman, Losses. I lost a word that went with universal. Is there one that goes with universal? Universal peace, universal love. Is the universe universal. So many quotation marks to say the world exists. The astral isn't festive, Mallarmé, and there is no midinette or tiny seamstress to save us. Uh, that was translated by the Cuban poet um, Victor Rodriguez Nunez and the translator Catherine Hedin. They're going to be here on October 6th uh, at 6.30, just next door for anyone who might uh, be able to come. I'm going to begin with some of the uh, Annunciation poems that, that John mentioned. Uh, I grew up with the name Mary, in a very Catholic household, uh, attending uh, a church called the Church of the Annunciation. Uh, and my closest friend was Gabriella. And this scene uh, uh, sort of stained uh, everything for me. And um, it's a scene that um, I, I really tried to forget in many, in many ways. Um, I, I find that the icon of uh, Mary and the ideals she holds up to be um, sort of punishingly destructive. Uh, but at the same time, I grew up um, loving her, and she also seemed to me the most palpable vision of uh, female power that I knew. Uh, I also loved the scene and, and continue to love it for the vision of um, encountering a being very much uh, unlike you and apprehending this being and hearing this being and being transformed. So at some point I thought, I can't stop imagining through this. I can't get it out of my imagination. So maybe 
uh, I can sort of destabilize Luke's version uh, by creating some others. This is Annunciation from the Grass Beneath Them from the perspective of uh, the blades of grass. How many moments did it hover before we felt it was like nothing else, it was not bird, light as a mosquito, the aroma of walnut husks, while the girl's knees pressed into us, every spear of us rising, sunlit and coarse, the wild bees murmuring through, what did you feel when it was almost upon us, when even the shadows her chin made never touched but reached just past the crushed mint, the clover clustered between us. How cool would you say it was, still cool from the clouds, how itchy the air, the girl tilted and lurched, and then we rose up to it, held ourselves tight when it skimmed just the tips of our blades. Didn't you feel softened? No, not even its flickering trembled. This is also in multiple voices. This is uh, imagining young girls literally assembling a jigsaw puzzle of this scene, um, puzzling over the mystery. Girls overheard while assembling a puzzle. Are you sure this blue is the same as the blue over there? This wall's like the bottom of a pool, it's color, I mean. I need a darker two-piece this summer, the kind with elastic at the waist so it actually fits. I can't find her hands. Where does this gold go? It's like the angels giving her a little piece of honeycomb to eat. I don't see why God doesn't just come down and kiss her himself. This is the red of that lipstick we saw at the mall. This piece of her neck could fit into the light part of the sky. I think this is a piece of water. What kind of queen? You mean right here? And are we supposed to believe she can suddenly talk angel? Who thought this stuff up? I wish I had a velvet bikini. <laughs> that flower is the color of the veins in my grandmother's hands. I wish we could walk into that garden and pick an x-ray to float on. Yeah, I do too. I'd say a zillion yeses to anyone for that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is sometimes said about Mary is that her yes redeems, Mary, uh, redeems Eve's no. This is Annunciation Eve to Ave. And it's uh, imagining her perspective. The wings behind the man I never saw but often afterward I dreamed his lips, remembered the slight angle of his hips, his feet among the tulips and the straw. I liked the way his voice deepened as he called. As for the words, I liked the showmanship with which he spoke them. Behind him, distant ships went still, the water was smooth as his jaw. And when I learned that he was not a man, bullwhip, horsewhip, unzip, I could have crawled through thorn and bee, the thick of hive, rosehip, courtship, lordship, gossip, and lavender. But I was quiet, quiet as eagerness, that astonished, dutiful foe. This is 
Annunciation in Nabokov and Star as John Metcher. And I'm using language from those two texts uh, collaged. I simply can't tell you how gentle, how touching she was. I knocked and she opened the door. She was holding her hem in her hands. I simply can't tell you how gentle, how calm she was during her cooperation. In the windowless hallway, I bent toward her. She touched her mouth with her damp smelling hand. There was no lake behind us, no arbor in flame flower. There was a stone wall, the dull white vague orchards in bloom. When she stood up to gather the almost erasable scents into the damp folds of her blue dress, when she walked through the rose garden, its heavy dove gray air dizzy with something unbreathable. There was something soft and moist about her, a dare, a rage, an intolerable tenderness. How could I have known what the sky would do? It was awful to watch its bright shapes churn and zero through her, knowing her body looked like anyone's body, paused at the edge of a garden. This is Annunciation under erasure. It's just an erasure of the gospel. And he came to her and said, the Lord is troubled in mind. Be afraid, Mary. The Holy will overshadow you. Therefore, be nothing, be impossible. And Mary said, and the angel departed from her. Also, as John mentioned, Annunciation as right whale with kelp goals. Um, I, might mention, I might mention that the right, the right whale uh, is endangered, and um, the fact that there's been an explosion of kelp goal population and, they've, and that they've learned how to uh, feed on the, uh, the, um, the wounds of these whales is, isn't helping. I tell you, I have seen them in their glee, diving fast into the sureness of her flesh, fast into the softness of her wounds. Have seen them peel her, seen them give themselves full to the effort and the love of it. Why wouldn't such sweetness be for them? For they outnumber her, for she is tender pockmarked full of openness, for they swoop down on her wherever she surfaces, for they eat her alive, for they take mercy on others and show them the way. At high tide, more gulls lift from the muscle beds and soar toward her, for they do sit and eat a sweetness prepared for them until she disappears again into the water.
met the, uh, the journalist and columnist Roger Cohen when he was just starting to work on uh, a family memoir that's uh, uh, now uh, the girl from Human Street. Um, a beautiful and harrowing uh, take on the last century. Um, but he was telling me about some of his family stories, including one, his uncle uh, was in Florence uh, having fought in World War II, and he was there during the last days of, of the war. And he said, uh, during those days, a bird came and uh, took up residence on his shoulder and went everywhere with him for days, slept by him at night, and, and, and people started uh, treating him like a kind of uh, saint. And, uh, and I thought the, the story was um, uh, kind of amazing and preposterous. And then he uh, showed me um, a photograph of his uncle. And uh, there is his uncle with a bird on his shoulder in, in Florence. And, uh, and I was interested in the ways that just given a little bit of proof, how quickly my imagination not wanted to not just believe that story, but wanted to make much, much more uh, of it. This is another true story. The journalist has proof. A photograph of his uncle during the last days of the war the whole of Florence unfolding behind him, the last standing bridge stretching over the Arno, and you could almost miss it, the point of what is being proved, a small bird on his left shoulder. Above the rubble, Florence is still Florence. The Duomo is intact, and somewhere in the background, Fra Angelico's winged creatures still descend through their unearthly light, and Da Vinci's calm, soft-featured angel approaches the quiet field. The war is almost over. The bird has made its choice and will remain perched for days on his shoulder. And the captain will soon go home to South Africa and then America and live to be an old man. And this once upon a time in Florence in 1944, a bird chose him, young, handsome, Jewish, alive, as the one place in the world to rest upon. When Noah had had enough of darkness, he sent forth a dove, but the dove found no ground to rest upon and so returned to him. Later he sent her again and she returned with an olive branch. The next time she did not return, and so Noah walked back into a world where every burnt offering smelled sweet, and God finally took pity on the imaginations he had made. Some people took the young captain walking around for days with that bird on his shoulder to be a saint, a new Saint Francis, and asked them to bless him, to bless them, which he did, saying, Ace, King, Queen, Jack, <laughs> making the sign of the cross. Saint good luck, saint young man who lived through the war, saint enough of darkness, saint ground for the bird, saint say there is a promise here, saint infuse the fallen world, saint how shall this be, saint shoulder, saint apostrophe, saint momentary days, saint captain, saint covenant of what we cannot say. And this is an address to uh, Mary. Hail Mary who mattered to me, gone or asleep among fruits, spilled in ash and dust, I did not leave you. Even now I can't keep from composing you, limbs and 
blue cloak and soft hands. I sleep to the sound of your name. I say, there is no Mary except the word Mary, no trace on the dust of my pillow slip. I only dream of your ankles brushed by dark violets, of honeybees above you murmuring into a crown. Antique queen, the night dreams on. Here are the pears I have washed for you. Here the heavy-winged doves asleep by the hyacinths. Here I am, having bathed carefully in the syllables of your name, in the air and the sea of them, the sharp scent of their sea foam. What is the matter with me? Mary, what word, what dust can I look behind? I carried you a long way into my mirror, believing you would carry me back out. Mm -hmm. I am still for you. I am still a numbness for you. Um, so I'm going to go from that to some new elegies um, for my mother. So I am one of your things now, one more of the things that survived you. I wear your long gray, gray herringbone coat into long gray days, returning always to your others. Drawers of good silverware, spices, framed Madonnas who look at me, wondering what I have done. When you said you were afraid you were going to die, I said everyone has to die. <coughs> I didn't mean it so cruel like that. I meant to wave it away with someday. I meant it was going to be, had to be a long time still. Everyone has to die, you said through your last days, as if to console or scold yourself. My one mother, sleep was sleep when you were here. And what are ours now? What fork, what knife, what soul, what, what all, what eats? Your name in stone is not sleep. You were like one of those zoo animals and everyone was there to watch you die. We offered you popsicles, ice, a sponge we'd dab on your lips. We crowded you, stroked your legs, your hair, tried to keep you kempt without hurting, disturbing you, prodding you until your eyes, when they opened, couldn't hold us. We hated that, hated your stillness, your days of stillness, not eating, not speaking, and we went on stroking your dark curls, your pale sheets, prodding until you finally sprang from them, burst through the night of them. You were almost up, attempting to stand up on your over-swollen feet as you pulled the soft, stretched neckline of your gown, your breathless, staggered, bleeding, trying to rise out of you. And I don't know if you knew it was me as I held you down to the bed down to your somehow still beautiful body as it failed you and when you were not the body we watched we crowded closer to watch um, for me one of the strangenesses of um, grief is what i've sometimes found myself doing as if under a spell like picking a fight for no reason uh, this is, yes, I'm talking to you. My dead mother is more beautiful than yours. <laughs> My dead mother will always be more beautiful than yours. Even her deadness is more beautiful. I am building a body in my mind, and it is your body. 
not disappeared into the grave, but into blizzarding swan-colored lines of lace holding something like your shape. And just like flesh, you open, absorbing each stray iridescence, each veil of updraft, upswirl, white noon scattering your edges, your something like a dress I can't put on. I am building your body, building a mind to move through every curve of you, compose you. Do you feel now my embellishment of falling ash, my flock of filaments, my costume of sound? The sun and the moon must make their haste. Make your deadness real to me now. Why should you be always so real and so near to me? I should know that you don't know me anymore. In every sun, I close my eyes and see you everywhere inside me. What does dead mean? Are there shades of different ways of being dead. Dead with the damp smell of lichen, dead, really dead with the quiet dead, and dead who steal and dead who stray. Every time I look at a pink-tinged sliver of moon rising fast above the yard, words start low inside my head and I'm talking to you as if it were you up there or as if we were looking up at the same night sky. Make yourself dead now, gentle mother. I'm calling, needing you now not to answer. Sonnet. So I don't have to call or worry about how to care for you, thank you. Don't have to try to read your face, try to understand what you are not saying. You are still always not saying. There was never too much of you. You were such a gentle mother, mother. Were you a person? How did you learn not to want to be a person? I was yours under your fingers, the light freckles of your hands. I'm afraid I am growing more gentle, forgetting your gentleness. It isn't mine, this idea of addressing you. Um, I've been thinking a lot about repetition and its um, powers and dangers. Um, for instance, the, the sort of maddening uh, situation of um, if uh, the possibility anyway that if, uh, for example, at a political debate if a untruth is stopped and corrected, there's uh, at least the possibility that what will be reinforced is the untruth rather than the remembered correction uh, undoing that, that falsehood. Uh, one study I read called this the, uh, called this illusory truth effects. Uh, even when we know better. And I was thinking about this as um, often I think what repeats in my head a lot repeats because it bothers me. I've encountered some falsehood or something that rings um, badly and it keeps going through my mind and, I, and I've wondered about that repetition in my mind of something I abhor how I become in new relationship to it with the repetition. Uh, so that's, that's the sort of engine behind this poem. In the beginning, God said light. 
and there was light. Now God says, give them a little theatrical lighting and they're happy than we are. So many of us dressing each morning, testing endless combinations, becoming in our mirrors more ourselves, imagining in an entrance the ecstatic weight of human eyes. Now that the sun is shearing toward us, what is left but to let it close in for our close-up? Let us really feel how good it feels to be still in it, making every kind of self that can be looked at. God, let us be your bright accomplices. God, here are our shining spines. Let there be no more dreams of being more than a beginning. Let it be that to be is to be backlit, and then to be only that light. I'm going to end with three sort of slant love poems. Um, I find that one of the challenges of um, trying to love someone is not just uh, staying attached to an idea of what I love in that person, but actually being present to that person. But that um, gets complicated when that person is not present. Uh, so uh, this is about looking at a tree in Italy. Too many pigeons to count and one dove. The startled ash tree, alive with them, wings lacing through silver green leaves, jumping from branch to branch, they rattle the leaves or make the green leaves sound dry. The surprise of a boat horn from below, increasingly voluptuous fluttering. One just there on the low branch, gone before I can breathe or describe it. Nothing stays long enough to know. How long since we've been inside anything together, the way these birds are inside this tree together, shifting, making it into a shivering thing. A church bell rings once, one pigeon flies over the top of a tree without skimming the high leaves and other flies to the tree below. I cannot find a picture of you in my mind to land on. In the overlapping of soft, dark leaves, wings look to be tangled, but I see when they pull apart, one bird far, one near, they did not touch. One bird seems caught flapping violently, one becomes still and tilts down. I cannot find the dove, have not seen it for minutes. One pigeon nips at something on a high branch, moves lower. It has taken this long for me to understand that they are eating. To flap their wings without leaving their branches, and I am tired of paying attention. The birds are all the same to me. It's too warm to stay still in the sun, leaning over this wood fence, trying to get a, get a better look into the branches. Why do pigeons gather in this tree or that one? Why leave one for another in this moment or that one? Why do I miss you now, but not now? My old idea of you, the feeling for you I lost and remade so many times until it was something else, as strange as your touch was familiar. Why not look up at the high white alps or down at the untrumpeted shadows bronzing the water or wonder why an almost lavender smoke hovers over that particular orange villa on the far shoreline or if I am capable of loving you better or at all from this distance. Walking in June dusk, 
what is between us beside the dark, the dank of pines, the gravel loose beneath us, faltering with each rustle or crunch or depth, and what we are not saying to each other, what is not tethered, what is not us, your flash lights beam slanting into the thickness, dead petals unfastening from their centers, hairless buds clustered at twig, twig tips above forked edges of leaves, what we have not forgiven, how we have come this close, stepping through what overflows toward us, what is arrested, suspended, all the shadows of what slanting toward us, everything we don't know how to feel. The awkward shapes our bodies make, walking over what might be moss or violets in the dark, over each beginning, each onset, each point not yet exceeded, still between us. Can't you slow down, I say, though I am not falling behind. And I'll end with this. Thanks for being here. The lushness of it. It's not that the octopus wouldn't love you. Not that it wouldn't reach for you with each of its tapering arms. You'd be as good as anyone, I think, to an octopus. <laughs> but the creatures of the sea, like the sea, don't think about themselves or you. Keep on floating there, cradled, unable to burn. Abandon yourself to the sway, the ruffled eddies. Abandon your heavy legs to the floating meadows of seaweed and feel the bloom of photoplankton, spindrift, sea spray barnacles. And the dark benthic realm, the slippery nectar, glide over the abyssal plains. And as you float, you can feel that upwelling of cold, deep water touch the skin stretched over your spine. No, it's not that the octopus wouldn't love you. If you touched, if it touched, if it tasted you, each of its three hearts would turn red. Will theologians of any confession refute me? Not the blue cap salmon, not its dotted head. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank all of you for coming. There are books for sale uh, here. And <laughs> there are books for sale. Buy a book. Uh, come next door, out the door, turn left uh, to the reception. There's food, there's drink, there's Mary Shebus. Thank you very much. Thank you.